Will, I'm going to ask you a little bit before we talk about the movie about meeting the man yeah. and what that was like. I understand you got to see him work, which yes. would be a memorable experience. But outside of the actual, you know, actualities of what an autopsy is, what is his demeanor in the room, and how does he? What is the respect that he shows? I, can't, I guess you can't call him for the patients, the cadavers with whom with that he's working with. He he deals with the dead as his patients, and. Um, uh, I went to to see him uh, perform uh, autopsies. I saw about five autopsies, and because after I saw the first one, it would it would have been nice to be finished with that. But um, it was such a part of who he who he is. He he is first of all, he's an absolutely beautiful man, and he he views himself as the deliverer of souls from this realm to the next. And he sees that as, as his job. So when he's, when he's performing an autopsy, it's, there's music, it's beautiful, he'll talk to the body, he's touching the, you know, and he, he is trying to, he's a deeply, deeply religious and, and spiritual man. And um, in, in watching him and spending that, that time with him, that was my, um, into the character. That's when I when I understood the level and depth of his spirituality, which is which is an interesting contradiction with science, you know. But that that was really the core of of who that that beautiful man was. Does he still today feel that in many ways meeting Mike Webster was something that was bad for him? Does he wish it never happened, or does he realize now that he had to do the work that he had to do? Uh, well, the, this movie opens on Christmas, so I think he's okay at, at this point. You know, like, we're here. <laughs> we're here. You know, which is which is an interesting story in a story for Bennett. This this is a man who grew up in in Nigeria and looked to America. Uh, part of the thing that that you know compelled me to make the movie in my first meeting with him, and we use it in the film, when he said, "As a boy growing up in Nigeria, heaven was here, and America." was here and he said to him it was the place where God sent all of his favorite people so for me to well I mean he hasn't been watching the news but <laughs> if Trump is elected that's not going to happen <laughs> you know so he he, uh, he he uh in in you know in that meeting with him and sitting and 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 talking with him uh about that I, I got so deeply uh, connected to him. So for this to be one of the uh, points in his story to be able to deliver his life and his pain and his, his experiences in this you know, film outside of everything for me, I love being able to be uh, a part of his life in that way. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, just an interesting coda to Bennett is, uh, you know, when he married Prima in Pittsburgh, before all this started to happen, he promised her, you know, these were people from know, rural Africa. He promised her as part of the American dream that he would build her a mansion. So you see in the film, he's beginning to build her their dream house. And then of course the walls close in, his life collapses, he's exiled, he's sent away. Literally the day before they were to move in, they get on a plane and leave Pittsburgh forever for, for California. And when I first met Bennett, I went to his house in Lodi and it's, you know, it was a nice ranch house on a cul-de-sac. And interestingly, just be, to answer your question is, from this movie, he finally bought her their dream house. Wow. And a big, nice, big house. Still in Lodi, <laughs> but it's a nice Lodi, big house. Yeah. So we finally moved in. Albert, but, did Does he know what net points are? <laughs> <laughs> He's got your points, Albert, actually. Um, did you get a chance to meet Dr. Wecht, Albert? No, I, uh, I worked on this for, I met Peter about, four months before when he was writing and I liked the part and I certainly liked the subject and I worked on the character I worked on it with Peter uh, Cyril Wecht is available on YouTube because he's a famous lecturer he was the preeminent guy who was who uh, dis he didn't believe in the one bullet theory with JFK he was the big guy who said, look at John JonBenet Ramsey's father. He has been this prominent uh, speaker. And so he's all over YouTube. So he's easy to 
study, mm -hmm. and then you have to deal with the words that are written. When I got to Pittsburgh, the night before my first day of shooting, I get this call, do you want to have dinner with Cyril Wecht? And I, I said, no. <laughs> you know, if a hunchback German walks in, I'm done, you know? <laughs> I, I've already perfected a character. I don't want to say, how are you? Nice to see you. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. So I never met him, but I, I felt like I knew him. And given his profession, I hope I never do meet him. <laughs> David, I want to ask you about the violence. I want to talk about Mike Webster's hands. Um, they're very prominent in the film, even for a fleeting moment. They look like hands that have gone through a meat grind. I mean, they're horrible hands, and I guess that's emblematic of the condition of his body. Could you talk a little bit about just his hands and how you even created that on film? We did four and a half hours of makeup every day, starting three o'clock in the morning. Um, hands were a big part of it. Uh, you, I, you know, I watched his, uh, his Hall of Fame speech over and over again, and, and they were a big part of it. Every time he grabbed somebody, you know, every single play of his career, he was the center, being grabbed, grabbing. He broke his fingers, hands, over and over again. Um, he, he supposedly had no concussions, which you know is impossible. Right. Um, uh, I've talked to players who, who've had a few recorded concussions, but they'll tell you they've had, you know, five times that. But those hands and his feet, too, um, if you saw pictures of his feet, I mean, at the end of his life, he literally was out um, uh, living in the snow in a pair of pants, with just a pair of pants, no shoes, no shirt, a blanket. He'd be out there for days when he was homeless, uh, walking around. I mean, his body uh, was and he, just And he destroyed. actually tased himself to go to sleep. I'm sorry? He tased himself to go to sleep. And that he literally could fall asleep. He, he, would, um, he was huffing ammonia at the end of his life to keep himself awake because he was afraid he would die if he went to sleep. And then he would use the tasers to knock himself out because he was so exhausted because um, he couldn't get the drugs that he needed. And that's uh, pretty much how he ended his life. Uh, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time talking or, or worrying over the NFL because it was a story... One, the story has been broken. They, they had already had a concussion settlement. Um, it's the story of this one gentleman, this one doctor. And it wasn't, the intention of it wasn't to sort of go after the NFL, but was to tell this story. Um, we were sensitive to the truth of the story, like you are in any narrative nonfiction movie. But um, we didn't do a lot of um, hand-wringing over what the future of the movie was going to be while we were planning to make the movie. Um, it, it, there were times when you, we would hear like, oh, will we be able to buy a spot on network television? It's like, well, that would be a, its own story if somebody <laughs> stopped us from buying a spot on network television for a movie. So, um, no, we didn't spend a lot of time on that. Peter, I want to ask you a little bit. This is, film is loosely adapted from a GQ article. Yeah. Um, what did the GQ article give you narratively that history hadn't? You know, it's, it's a brilliant piece. Um, 2009 was just before Dave Dewerson killed himself, uh, which happened in the film, and, the, and a couple years before Junior Seau killed himself. Jean Marie Laskus, who's a fantastic journalist, um, was able to synthesize what was clearly an epidemic of football players dying violently, not just killing themselves, sometimes killing their families, um, not just men in their 40s and 50s, sometimes teenagers and men in their 20s. And it was an epidemic that was happening all over the country, but nobody was watching it because these were men who would slip into a cave and vanish mm -hmm. without a word. Jean Marie really started to synthesize and put it together, uh, but it wasn't until she met Bennett that she had, you know, I used to be a journalist, and in journalism, there's a phrase that we all have that we all hope for, it's called the holy shit moment. <laughs> you know, you could be reporting on a story for weeks or months, and until you get to that moment where you're like, holy shit, <laughs> like, that's the story. And she had it, and it was a really, it was a, it was a fantastic launching off. That was my moment when I saw my deal. <laughs> I wanna <laughs> that was my moment when I knew I was going to get to work with you, Albert. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my band went and saw the movie um, out in London, and 
first, you know, I was, I felt kind of cool, you know, seeing the movie before it comes out. Ooh. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, just totally inspired by, um, you know, the story. I mean, Will Smith could act in a movie about potatoes and it'd be <laughs> great, you know. But Will um, Smith is Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> Christmas. 2017, I think it's in development. But, <laughs> you know, and so I didn't want to make a song that was, you know, literal, literal, you know, so literal to the, the story, you know, and so the, the song So Long, it comes from a personal thing, you know, just me going back, you know, people back home saying that, you know, I don't deserve to be where I'm at because, you know, I haven't worked as hard or long as, you know, some musicians who've been doing it longer, you know, and so it's like saying that I love where I'm from, but maybe I need to leave because, you know, I'm not feeling the love. Were you shooting during the NFL season? Yeah, we started shooting at the end of October. So right what was it like being in Pittsburgh during the NFL season? I mean, everybody, I mean, you see extras wearing jerseys. I, that's not, that's real life, right? Will, I see you're shaking your head. jerseys. Yeah. Everybody in the whole <laughs> city wears a jersey on a Sunday. Yeah, it was, um, you know, the black and gold is real in, in Pittsburgh, you know. So, um, you know, I think it added an, um, uh, an, an extra we knew what we had to do and it, it definitely gave us an authenticity and uh, I like that word missionized. I've never used that before. I'm going to start using that. Yeah, yeah. But it was that, you know, we were, we were missionized. I wouldn't, in, I wouldn't use that. Don't use it. Okay. I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> You're right. Nothing You're good's right. going to come Nothing's out of gonna, Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know, but actually being in, in Pittsburgh, it was, um, it was really heavy in a lot of ways. Um, the, we were shooting in a lot of the places where, uh, you know, some of the actual scenes occurred. Um, the, the, the woman, for example, there, it's a brief moment when the slides are being made for Mike Webster's brain samples. And we use the actual woman who did the original brain sample. So there was a lot of that, um, uh, as an actor, it's really, uh, it, it, it was heavy, but it, it, it kept you completely grounded and completely um, focused and, and, and clear about the, the, the honesty and depth and truth of what you were trying to portray. We don't really know what's going to happen in terms of the NFL and football and the impact of this movie. NFL football is the largest spectacle in the history of man. It is hugely wealthy. It's the richest sport in the world. It's the most watched sport in the world. The, the Super Bowl last year was the most watched thing on television in history. And it's only getting bigger, weirdly, while this kind of iceberg is off in the distance. You know, this movie, the subject matter coming close. And so we don't know what happens when this massive juggernaut collides with a very simple truth. So that being said, you know, I played football through two years of college and I love watching the game. It's graceful, it's beautiful. And I didn't make a decision to stop watching football. I just have found myself drifting away from the television when it's on in my house. My son played at uh, Oaks Christian. So it was um, you know, some, almost the most fun I've ever had at a, as a parent was watching that kid catch that football. And uh, it, was, it was never even a subject, you know, you, we were worried, you know, we were worried if he would break his leg. We were, the big thing was spinal injury. That was what all the parents were talking about is, is spinal injury. Um, so the idea that there was a possibility of long-term brain damage was, was never a question. So I, I, I felt like, uh, you know, as a, as a parent, I had to make this film just, for people to know, at a minimum, we have to to know, and then you can make a decision. So, with that, I was asked the question: What would I, you know, if 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 with the information I have, and we're we're back to my son being 14 years old, and he wants to play, and you know, I said that's that's a that's a really difficult question. At 14, your kids are invincible, right? So, the, you know, to sit them down and say, well, son, let's uh, let let's discuss uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. You know, it it, it just um, it would be very very difficult for me to demand that he not play 
a game that he loved. I, I would give him all of the information. We would go through. We would he would understand everything that was happening, and you know, I just the my style of parenting. I would have to make the decision with him.